there is like a structure to socialization that I feel like I missed out when yeah. I was younger. And therefore that's why I'm like really awkward in those situations. But like improv where like anything can happen, you're like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's easy. I could do yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's true. Uh, yeah. I just, I just need a slight sandbox to play in, yeah. like, uh, but just an open field. I don't know what to do. Yeah. It's like, Oh, you as a real person, ah, I don't know how to, but you as a character, let's get into yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Chell from Notes from My Improv Notebook. That's right, I'm back, and I've been gone for too long. Well, that's what happens when you get busy in life, but I'm on my way to catching up. And with this week's episode, I'm so excited to announce that I brought in Jake Jabor. He is a fantastic improviser over at UCB LA. Uh, he is wonderful. You can catch him on Instagram, which I will link at Wake Up with Jacob. Uh, such a great person, so insightful has lots of years of experience and what was so weird and what I so much enjoyed was that even though we studied at different schools, we have the same kind of approach to the art form. And um, I'm not gonna ruin it by saying anything, but you're gonna find out. But before we get there, please press pause, rate, review this podcast. Each rate and review actually helps us get to more improvisers just like you. But without further ado, Please get it up for Jake Jabor. I'm really excited so much here. Thank you. Notes from my improv uh, notebook. Welcomes Jake Jabor. Let's give a round of applause. All right, good. Thank you. Oh, great. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Welcome. Wow, Thanks. that was a really strong round of applause. Yeah, that was great. There had to be like a million people yeah, doing yeah. it. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. You're very popular. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah. thanks for having me. No, not a problem. I'm really excited uh, to have you on the podcast. We actually have a mutual friend. That's right. Uh, Amber Preston, mm-hmm. who was like, you put out a, I love the way you did it, by the way, oh. which is you put out a status. This is what I want. I'm willing to, to do this. And then, bam, people were like, hey, if that's what you want, here you go. Yeah. I really appreciate or I really admire people that are like that. Oh, thank you. I do, too. I'm not great about it, so I'm trying to get a little better. I got... It's something that I'm self-conscious about, especially, I think, living in Los Angeles. And, like, if you are trying to work in sort of the entertainment or creative industry, it's like you... There is a skill required to sort of be like... Here's what I want. Here's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And it's something that's like does not come naturally to me that I'm trying to get better about doing. I don't, I I think you learn that skill when you move out here. Mm. Like, I really do feel like I was not ready to ask for a lot of stuff up until I started asking for stuff, which was probably a year ago. Now, I'm still not at the point where like, this is what I need. And people are like, okay, do this. I'm more of like, okay, I'm going to ask and I'm going to fret about it for two weeks. Yeah. And then I'll just, you know, maybe send a wavy emoji first. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's really admirable what you're doing. And in uh, the fruit of getting things that you want, um, you actually uh, wrote a book, you've done tours, you're on a podcast. Yeah. So you're doing it, I would say. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying it. All of that stuff, all of those uh, things that you mentioned, all came out of, they were kind of responses to not getting what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Because again, like in Los Angeles and in the improv community and all sorts of like entertainment and creative arts is like, there are so many different thresholds or like gatekeepers along the way. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't like the feeling of rejection. And I found that what I sort of do naturally is like when I get that feeling, I try and push away from it by pursuing something that doesn't require getting approval for it or whatever. So like the podcast or writing the book or like doing a show is like, cool. I don't want to feel like I, I've, and I was doing it, not necessarily consciously doing it, but when I looked back, it was like, Oh, every time, I didn't make a Herald team or whatever. I ended up going like, I'm going to write this or I'm going to do that. Yeah. And it gave me sort of a place to direct my energy and allowed me to feel sort of in control of my own 
I don't know, journey or whatever. Yeah, and I think that's a very smart way to approach, especially coming to Los Angeles, because a lot of the times you won't get the things that you think that you want, and <laughs> but that will actually put you on the path to getting closer to the things that you actually need. Yeah. And what you said that was really important and that I really can appreciate is that when you didn't get what you wanted, you basically applied that energy to like, okay, well, essentially it's this thing that I want to do. So let's start heading in that direction. And I think what is happening is because you are making those decisions in the past, it's like you're looking to where you are now, right? Yeah. You've done a tour in Europe. You've done a tour across the United States. You have a podcast and you wrote a book. Like, yeah. those are such cool things, man. <laughs> Thanks. You should yeah. really be proud of yourself. <laughs> oh, because, thank you. Like, in all honesty, if I just moved out to Los Angeles and then I was like, 10 years from now, these are the things you'll have, I'd be like, Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. That's really awesome. I do sort of go like, whoa, I never thought I would be doing these types of things. Yeah. Like, even though it feels like I'm not where I want to be, I'm so much further or in a place that I never saw myself getting to. Yeah. Kind of. And um, I think it goes back to that, like, that approval seeking. Like, there is a lot of uh feels like gatekeeping in terms mm -hmm. of like well if i make a herald team then i'm this i'm this player and i'm yeah. the i can do anything right and it's really that like ultimately that yes doesn't control who you can be right yeah because if you just got no's all the time and you're just like i guess i'll just not do anything about right. it you wouldn't have those things yeah so, it's true. wow that's awesome yeah. well thanks yeah now you are coaching a team at ucb right now I'm on a Herald team at UCB, okay. and then I'll occasionally uh, sub in for coaches on the mess hall team, and then I do my independent workshops that are not affiliated with UCB, but most of the people who come to take them have heard about them through that community. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, what forced you to start doing workshops in the city of Los Angeles? Well, that's a great question. So I started coaching... Um, my background is in special education. So I was a special education teacher for eight years and I was doing a little bit of coaching on the side and then I was able to pick up more coaching and it just kind of built like that. And then I was sort of at a place where I need this to be a little bit more. And it also came out of me looking at my experience being on a house team and the experiences I had taking workshops, taking classes, and being on practice groups, and recognizing that none of those reflected my house team experience. Mm -hmm. And the house team experience was, here are seven potential strangers. You're going to play together. You're going to practice together and then put up shows. And in a class setting, it was like 15 strangers. Maybe I played with the same person twice practice groups or teams that were formed was like, oh, I knew everybody. So there wasn't something that reflected that sort of model. So I was like, well, I want to offer that model because I think that's a skill in itself is like learning to play with seven people that you don't know and having a show. So I started to write a curriculum around that idea of like team focused improv. And I was seeing this thing where like when I first moved out here, there were maybe 200 people auditioning and now i think there's you know like over 700 wow. and i think the community is probably 2000 and so there really became this emphasis i don't think it anybody was deliberate in it but to say you've got to stand out in a sea of 2000 mm -hmm. and so everybody was kind of learning similar skills as how to stand out but I sat in on a round of auditions and I noticed that the people who were standing out were the people who were being the most supportive team players, which is something that was really pushed uh, when I started. So I was like, I want to create a workshop that replicates a house team setting and em em enforces and emphasizes how to play as a great team player. Mm -hmm. So that's what I started to do. And then I took everything that I'd sort of learned over the last decade and tried to boil it down to its most usable so rather than like here's how you do good improv i started to say like here's how you do effective improv which sounds less fun but it is more fun because it's like i'm just telling you from 10 years of experience that your percentage of having an easy fun scene will be done through doing these things 
and start to take the pressure off somebody who's like, I can't do this, or I don't have a good sense of humor, or I'm bad at this. And I think improvisers or comedians or artists tend to internalize a lot. And so yes. what I was trying to do is put the focus on like, that scene maybe didn't go well, but it's because of all the like elements in it or the recipe for it was a hard recipe to make something out of. So like, don't put that on yourself so much. Like, here are some tools that you can use so that the scene is going to be easier to play. Yeah. So that your your voice can come through. Because I also, I've seen so many great comedians get frustrated and quit. And it was like, they were quitting because they were like, I'm not any good at this. or And I was like, I don't, I don't think that's the case. Like, I think the reason that it's like improv doesn't necessarily pay to like it's hard to get paid to perform as an improviser is because it is a skill that I think anybody can do well versus like professional basketball or something. It's like they get paid millions of dollars because very few people can do that. Yeah. But we don't get paid anything because it's like, you can be good at this. Like everybody has, and sometimes it takes like time and experience to develop your voice, but given the structure or given sort of some guidelines, it's like, I can set you up in a scene where you're going to feel successful and you're going to contribute to it uniquely in your own way. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think the coolest thing about your workshop is that you set out with a goal and then you created around that goal. Um, that's so awesome. And then that students come to it, knowing what they're going to receive to it is awesome. I do find that Yes, as a teacher, you do have to give these students like types of tools that would be like, this is what will get you back on track. Mm -hmm. Because I do find in a workshop environment is that you have 12 or however many people coming in, but coming in from like different perspectives where like it's different from a class where it's like level three, you just came from level two so right. we can all. So it's always interesting in those workshop environments that each individual person may be need a little bit more or a little bit less of what you're trying to offer, but they're yeah. all trying to offer the same thing. And as improvisers, we do internalize a lot of these, like if that scene was horrible, it's all like, I guess I'm a horrible human being. Yeah. I should be shot to the sun. Right? right. Yeah. Yeah. And so like I'm finding in my workshops lately, it's a lot of building up people of like, yeah. you're the best. You're great. You can do this because it is that self doubt that ultimately stops us from either taking that next step in our journey or completely just taking us out of the journey altogether. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think what is something that like, what's a skill that people like to come to you that you approach that yeah. we can talk about this on this podcast? Cool. So the one, the one I was going to focus on today is like something I, that I see happen a lot of times is that people are sometimes resistant to playing the voice of reason in the scene. Yeah. Um, the essential audience surrogate, the person in the scene who's telling the audience, hey, what's happening in this scene is weird or unusual, um, and it's my job to let the audience know that it is, because like we often assume like the scene we're watching takes place in the world we live in, but that's not the case until they tell us that's the case, right? Mm -hmm. So there needs to be somebody in the scene and it can be the person who's being unusual, too. They can have a moment of self-doubt or self-reflection. But somebody to tell the audience, hey, this is unusual. Because the audience is waiting to know when the rules of the world have been broken. And so I'll see funny things being done, but the audience won't laugh until somebody goes like, hey, that's unusual. Uh, and then they go like, oh, okay, the rules have been broken. Why do you think it's hard for people to approach this audience surrogate? Or some people call it the straight man sometimes? Yeah. Because I think they see it as a placeholder. Like, we assume that the person who is being unusual is getting all the laughs. Mm. And and so the person who's being, yeah, the straight man or the voice of reason or the audience surrogate is going, well, I'm just here to say no or to try and stop this or I'm not getting to be the fun character. Mm -hmm. um, and so then what I see happen often is they start to make unusual choices. So then they start to also be unusual. And so now the audience is going, 
well, I don't, now I don't understand what rules are being broken because both people in the scene are being weird in different ways. And the brain likes patterns and the brain, we need to patternize so that it, patternization leads to predictability and then predictability allows for surprise. Mm -hmm. But if both people in the scene or everybody in the scene is being weird in a different way, there's no patternization, there's mm -hmm. no predictability. And so everything that is a surprise if everything's a surprise, then nothing is a surprise. Yeah. So I think people often go like, well, I don't want to just be the, I want to contribute my voice to this scene. And if I'm just like the coworker who's going, you're being uh, weird or wild, anybody could do that. So then they start to make their own unusual choices. And then the scene starts to, it's, it becomes the audience what's that it becomes a weird town yeah it becomes a weird town uh so then the audience is like well i don't know what's happening in this scene yeah what am i supposed to laugh at it's so yeah. all weird <laughs> right everything is weird yeah i think the voice of reason is like a incredibly important and b is an equal participant in the scene sometimes people feel that they're just being led by the unusual person and it's like no you are making choices too yeah I believe that the, uh, man, uh, I love the voice of reason. Uh, that's something that a skill that I've learned since I've been out here when I started taking classes out here is that there needs to be a voice of reason. And I found that being the voice of reason can be so satisfactory because I do feel like if they set it up correctly for what the crazy person or the weird person in the yeah. scene is about to do, like it could just rock the house. Yeah. And it's just all about applying Oh man, you said so many good things. It's all about applying that pattern and how can I really approach this pattern so that the weird guy can just hit it out of the park. Right. Right? Yeah. And I I totally agree. I think that some people see when they come to shows, what they see is like, oh, I'm watching and the weird guy is having so much fun. He's doing all the weird stuff. But this other guy, he's just like, it doesn't look like it's fun. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, like, it's both of them working together to create that awesome environment of patternization. Yeah. And I totally hang my hat on patternization. Yeah. Every workshop I go, find the pattern. What's the pattern? Yeah. What's the pattern? You yeah. know, let's keep it simple. It's, so. uh, yeah, it's huge. Uh, yeah, when I taught, uh, like, kindergarten and first grade, it was like, that's one of the skills is like we do a yellow block, then a blue block, then a yellow block, then a blue block. So that when a red block pops up, we go, oh, that broke the pattern. Like, yeah. uh, and it's something that we teach uh, children at a young age. It's something that the brain naturally does. And it's like it is fundamental to having a su successful scene. Yeah. And, y you know, I totally agree. It's like once everyone can do this because it's all pattern recognition and breaking those patterns. Right. Yeah. And we make it so complicated when we first start out of like, Oh, I have to be, I have to uh, uh, match that. But you're finding out that like you're doing a peas in the pod scene. Why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's to establish that pattern. But right. as like a new person coming into it, you're just like, I think we're just doing it to heighten stuff. Yeah. You know? And so like, if we ultimately approach all improv from a sense of like, let's establish the pattern. Let's be on the same page so that it's recognizable to my partner, recognizable to me, and recognizable to the audience, so that way we can break apart and do whatever we need to do next. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah. When did this whole, like, being a part of the audience surrogate really click in for you? I mean, it started to click in probably really like a couple of years ago where I started to sort of, like, really understand what it means to sort of be explicitly clear in a scene and to let the audience know exactly what is happening. Like um, my, the thing I say in the first day of my workshop is like, when you're in a scene, you're responsible to three parties, uh, your scene partner, backline and your, or your team, and then the audience. And if any one of those three parties does not know what's happening, the scene is going to be difficult. Yeah, I agree. That's uh, so totally it's it. like, get everybody on the same page. And then I started to sort of go like playing on my own teams and stuff. I started to sort of go like I'd be on the back line and I'd go like, OK, I know that this is the unusual behavior. The other person in the scene would start to do stuff that was unusual. And then I would go like, well, now that seems more unusual. And then for a herald, right, if that happens in the first beat and then everybody on the back line would be like, OK, and then the second beat would start. And if the person didn't highlight essentially the same thing I did from the 
that I saw in the first beat, then I knew that like we didn't make it clear enough yeah. because that started to divide the audience. I remember being in a scene and talking with my scene partner afterwards and he was like, it was weird. We would get laughs on this and then we would get laughs on that. He's like, but we wouldn't get laughs on this thing. And I was like, I think we were getting laughs from part of the audience for this thing. Then we were getting laughs from a different part of the audience for that thing. (laughs) And then we started to lose laughs because the audience was now split. And anytime they didn't see their thing that they recognized as the pattern happening, they felt lost. So like that feeling I felt on the back line of going, I don't know how to support this because I'm not sure what uh, is unusual here because two things are unusual or being in the scene and going like, I can hear different parts of the audience laughing is like, Oh, there are, we're on different pages. And so then the scene is less effective. This is such an amazing thing. Thank you so much for, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Can anyone like go and take your workshop? You can sign up at weimprov.net. Yeah. I teach two levels, uh, an eight week course with, two shows for charity and then a level two which is four weeks and four shows that's performance based and all the shows are also for charity that's so awesome and i know that your workshop is really cool because it actually uh you reach out to different teachers too and you like have bring different voices in which is so awesome i have guest instructors uh who offer different points of view and different perspectives my attitude is always like try on all the hats and find the ones that fit for you no coach is going to have all the answers uh, i totally agree with that yeah like the message from one coach even though it's the same message from a different coach is somehow going to relate to you better yeah it's so weird that that actually happens yeah and i i think like there is no substitute for experience so like yeah i want to i definitely want to coach and love coaching but i also recognize like to get better, you got to hear from other people as well. So, like, give them that opportunity. Well, cool. Uh, well, again, I really appreciate you being a part of this podcast. Oh, uh, absolutely. One of the things that I'm so, like, in awe of your ability and what I think is so cool is that you actually wrote a book. Oh, thank you. Um, and so if you could just give me a little bit more or, like, want- yeah. For people interested in improv, it's a, a travel memoir about an improv podcast tour I took. In 2017, uh, we did nine cities and nine shows. You can listen to the live shows uh, on the Meet Improv. And it's a lot about improv, uh, but it's also a lot about me personally. Um, I had a lot, uh, three relationships sort of come to an end right before the trip happened. My roommate moved out. Uh, My girlfriend and I uh, had a planned breakup, and my grandpa passed away. So uh, the book is called Training to Be Myself. And the idea is I sort of, part of my identity was wrapped up in my relationships to other people of being a boyfriend, a roommate, and a grandson. Uh, And when those relationships ended, I spent a a long portion of the trip sort of rediscovering what that means for me. And then there's a bunch of sort of pop culture essays sort of infused within it because I wanted to give the experience of some of the books I like the most, which is like feeling that you're on the road with someone. Uh, one of my favorite books was On the Road. By, oh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was a really absolutely. good one. Uh, uh, feeling on the road and like trying to discover yourself. Yeah. And I think what's really cool about this whole book is it goes back to what your theory about improv is, which is finding out what your wants are, especially when life kind of just stops like, yeah, you don't want that anymore. You can't have it. <laughs> and it's just uh, like, okay, yeah, I got to redefine myself. Yeah, that's very perceptive. <laughs> Yeah, having to figure out what my wants are and what actions I can take to get them. Yeah, Um, well, I really feel like this book will help people that are coming into improv or any improviser because I do feel like this art form attracts people that are like, I am in a certain point of my life that's kind of weird, but I'm just going to go into this weird pattern recognition people yelling in my face and i'm having a good time thing (laughs) yeah uh, and there's plenty about uh my eight failed auditions for herald night you can read all about that and how uh i persevered through it and came out on the other end getting to do a national podcast tour so uh if anybody is in their heads about their improv you can read the book and empathize or sympathize or relate if anything it shows you that success isn't defined by the people who can say yes to getting certain things success is defined by what you want and what you make of it yeah 
Yeah, yeah. really well said. Yeah. yeah. You can pre-order the book at inkshares.com. Uh, just uh, search Training to Be Myself. And yeah, I have about two and a half months, and I'm trying to get enough pre-orders to get the final publishing and editing and marketing done with it. So I'd really appreciate anybody's support if it sounds like something you'd want to check out. Jake Jabor, you deserve everyone's support. Oh, thanks. And thank you so much for doing this podcast. Oh, thank we you for really appreciate me. it. I could do this all day. That was Jake Jabor on the Notes from My Improv Notebook podcast. Guys, he is so talented. His wonderful book, Training to Be Myself, which is available for pre-order now. I'm going to put a link and all this information in the description. So if you need to know anything, you can just head to the description. He also has a workshop out here in Los Angeles. So if you're interested, reach out to him and find out more about We Improv. Also, I'm going to link another podcast of his into this description because I feel like if you like Jake, you're going to reach out. You're going to be like, where can I find more Jake? Well, just look in the description and there will be more Jake. If you haven't already, please rate, review, subscribe to this podcast. Every rate review actually gets us out to other improvisers just like you. And if you have any questions again, please feel free to reach out to highsilentx at gmail.com. Guys, have a wonderful week. Goodbye. All right. Well, awesome. Uh, I feel a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, so do I. Okay, yeah, that cool. was good. Yeah. Awesome. Great.